Well, this is Tom Fox back again with Megan Doherty for another episode of Podcasting for Business, the book. Welcome back, Megan. Oh, thank you so much for having me, Tom. I'm glad to be here. Megan, this episode will conclude our journey through your section on metrics. But before we get to the episode, could you really give our listeners the sense of not simply what we've talked about from the metrics, but it's about a third, maybe 20 percent <laughs> of all of the information you have for each metric and explain really what's in the book and why it's different from what we're talking about in our pod. Oh, th thank you so much for asking that, because, yeah, we are we're going into kind of what the metrics are, how they apply to business and and some examples and, and where they fit within the blueprints framework. But the actual metric sections of the book, they go a lot deeper than that. So it's got the explanation. It's got the types of businesses that it's for. We've got information about the blueprints and why they fit or don't fit within different ones. And then I think really importantly, or most importantly, each of these metrics has a full how to optimize your podcast section for it. And so we talk about kind of general high level, what you need to do to optimize your show for it. But we also get into the weeds of this is what you have to optimize in your workflow. This is what you have to optimize in your production process. And this is what you have to optimize for in your promotion. And that is all uh, followed by what's it going to cost? We have estimates of how much these different things are going to cost to deploy in your podcast and how to evaluate, like how to track the data over time and then how to make an evaluation about whether or not it worked. It has been called kindly by my spouse, exhaustive as they were doing the copy editing, but they said it was also amusing. So it's not going to be all work, but there is, I do want to emphasize a lot more to what we're talking about that you will find in the book, which you can get at a very reasonable rate from your fine internet bookseller. Well, Megan, with that, let's <laughs> take up the first metric of this podcast, which mm -hmm. is monthly recurring revenue. This would once again seem to be a self-evident topic for conversation, but uh, tell us why it's an important metric for any uh, business podcast. You know, this is, again, it's one of the options that you have to optimize for as a business podcast. And this one is it's not the most popular because to optimize for monthly recurring revenue, when we're talking in the context of this type of podcast, it means putting some of your content behind a paywall. And it might be part of your podcast itself, or it might be a paid uh, community or membership associated with the show. It might be an entirely private podcast. So you can podcast uh, only for paying subscribers. And you can have versions of your podcast uh, where there's a public version that's free and there's a paid version that uh, is either ad-free or has some extra bonus content to it. Uh, or it can be uh, a, a paid community for listeners of the show to engage with you and get more access to you, maybe your guests, and to each other. And this works best when you already have a lot of fans. It's really hard to make this work if you don't have a large existing audience of people who could potentially pay you. Because then you're going to find yourself in the situation of working really hard to get subscribers who are paying $15 $30 a month. Uh, you're going to work as hard to get that sale as you would to sell your products or services. It just there isn't a business case for it. But if you've got a lot of audience and you are running out of things to sell them, this can be a really great way to add a revenue stream to your business and to make your podcast kind of wholly profitable. Uh, and of course, this Megan, is another conversion podcast, uh, okay. podcast metric. How about an example? Now, this is another one that we got from the State of Business Podcasting report for that list for last year. And I thought this was brilliant. So this one podcast that we looked at, they are your video podcasting. So all their episodes were released on YouTube and that was kind of their primary distribution channel. And I was watching one of the episodes to collect the data. And they said, though they introduced to the podcast and they welcomed everyone who was there live. Paid members of their community are able to attend podcast recordings and ask questions of their famous guests. Genius strategy. I thought it was brilliant. And so they had this membership community where paid members, paid listen, listeners who were paying for access, got this really privileged access to the hosts and to their guests. And then they made the public version, which is a promotional vehicle for the whole thing. So clever, such a great strategy and a really good example uh, of a monthly recurring revenue stream that this business had developed for itself. Megan, the next one would seem to be a little bit different. It is. And it, it's one of my favorites. And it's one of your favorites. <laughs> Labor savings cost. Why is this a metric and what blueprints does it fit? So I 
absolutely love labor cost savings as a metric for podcasts because it's one of those benefits that you can get for basically any blueprint. I absolutely love labor cost savings as a metric for business podcasts because it's such an efficient use of your time and your energy in creating this content for people. When I'm talking about labor cost savings, I'm talking about using your podcast to create content that is going to do work that otherwise you would have to do or members of your team would have to do and you'd have to pay them for. Uh, and that means creating content that's going to answer questions. It's going to help facilitate sales cycles. Uh, it's going to let clients help themselves to information rather than coming to you for it. And it's going to make it easier for your team members to help your customers and clients through what they need to do. Uh, and so this is just, it's really great if you do have heavy customer service needs or if you have a team that you need to train. Because another great example for this, you can create a podcast that is going to train all of your new team members on your processes, theories, and systems and service level standards. So it's a really fun way to use this digital media and give it all these different lives that is going to cut down the amount that you have to pay to have these things done other way. So it fits really well with audience engagement podcasts because you are really listening to the audience, what they need, creating that for them, and then nurturing them with that content. And also content podcasts, of course, because content podcasts are content podcasts. And it can work with conversion as well. Sometimes you can design content that someone will convert for both saving you time and making you some money or growing your email list. So here, as an example, you were actually able to give a personal example. I was. Of your, your personal experience. <laughs> Tell us about that, because it's a great story. It was. The very first podcast that we ever did it was back in 2018, and it is uh, gone to the sands of time. Do not look for it. We have if you look really hard, you'll find it, but it would be a waste of your time. We were specifically trying to create content. The, our business at that time was really angled to be about repurposing. And of course, we've moved on from that since then, but we wanted to create a demonstration, like a concept podcast, basically, where we could show just how cleverly we were repurposing all of the content that we created. Now, that podcast didn't last. That initial like pivot didn't work out. But one of those episodes that we did record for that podcast has done so much work for us in the business over time. And it has saved some of my labor in writing this book because a chapter, I think it was the three C's of podcasting first appeared in that original kind of defunct podcast, made it into the second podcast. That was an episode I didn't have to write, made it into at least one email series and one training and more content we didn't have to write that people could then self-serve. I could point people to. It was the three C's of podcasting, connection, content, and charisma. And it's in the book as well. So this one piece of content has been educating people on this important topic for years. We can point people at it. I don't have to explain it all the time. And I didn't have to rewrite those chapters of the book or the more recent podcast episodes where it has appeared. And that can happen again and again and again with your content. Megan, I was, I wouldn't say intrigued with the next one, but I was interested in this because I would have thought it's not a direct metric yet. You have it as a metric and that's affiliate sales. Why this metric and what does it mean, I should probably ask, and then what blueprint does it fit? Affiliate sales are, again, they're not a great choice for every business, but they can be a really interesting extra monetization strategy for many businesses. So affiliate sales, of course, they happen when you promote someone else's products and services and you get a payment when somebody buys them based on your recommendation, usually through a link that they can track. And because your podcast is one of the places where it's, it's your platform, it's your channel, this is where people are paying attention to you, hopefully, and the more of them that are paying attention to you there, the better this metric will work. You can use your airtime to promote other people's products and services and get affiliate commissions for that. And this can be great for a lot of companies where there are a lot of lots of technology services, software, technology service providing. They often have affiliate programs. And so then if you are not otherwise monetizing that airspace. There's no reason you can't say, oh, and by the way, check out this amazing email software. I absolutely love it. Here's my link. You'll get a discount. And then you'll get a little bit of income. If anybody ever does you know, follow that link, make that purchase, you'll be credited with the sale. And if you are looking at adding revenue streams using your podcast, this is one way that you can do it with your podcast. How about an example of affiliate marketing, excuse me, affiliate sales as a metric? Perfect. I will also say this is um, best with an audience engagement podcast, and I'll explain why, and then I'll promise I'll give you an example. <laughs> but this is an audience engagement podcast, and it is the more audience you have, the better it's going to work. So if you're investing in growing your audience, then in 
creating affiliate ads within your podcast can be one of the ways that you monetize them. For most businesses, it's not going to be the best way to monetize. I want to put that out there, but it's on the table. And I had a great conversation actually with a guest on my show this year with someone whose business was in wellness coaching and kind of in that area. And she was podcasting for a long time as mainly a thought leadership way to kind of get her idea, her concepts out there. And because she was in health, there are lots of products and services uh, that are out there. And she had strong opinions about which ones worked and which ones doesn't. So if there was a product that she really liked and she would recommend to people to help them with these particular issues, if they had an affiliate program, why not go ahead and sign up for it? And then when you recommend a product that you would recommend anyway, make some money from it. And that became one of the, as her audience grew, because that was a real focus of, of her work and her promotion was growing that audience of listeners, more and more people, it became a more and more significant part of her revenue from the podcast and for her business as a whole. So that was a situation where it worked out really well. And I think kind of proves the case for me a little bit that it can work well, because I'm generally very much of the opinion, and you'll hear this with this metric and the next couple that we're going to be talking about. It's not the most efficient or the highest return on investment for most businesses, but that doesn't mean you can't do it if you don't want to, or your business is right for it. That leads us to the net next metric of sponsorship dollars. And I guess the first question I have is, aren't all listeners just going to open the table of contents, see sponsorship dollars, go to that page and read that the very first before they read anything else in the book? You know what? You're right. I should upload a new version to Amazon that has on the first page of the sponsorship section a frowny face that says, nope. <laughs> and here, here's why. And this is probably if I've got a biggest pet peeve about the podcasting industry, it's the obsession with sponsors. Because if you are going to go through all of this trouble and you are going to build it, you are going to create amazing content and you are going to work really hard to interview great guests or create amazing solo content that teaches people and that inspires and that shares great stories. And you're going to spend time and money on creating great promotional materials. You're going to put them out there. You're going to start growing an audience. People are going to start responding to you. They're going to send you emails asking how things are going for your opinion on stuff. You've got this amazing audience. They care about you. They like you. They know you. They trust you. So you're going to sell it to a mattress company for $45. Does that make any sense to you as a business owner? It doesn't to me <laughs> because if I'm doing all of that work, I want the benefit from my business, not somebody else's. <laughs> and, but yeah, <laughs> that said, it's not a bad strategy. It can be a really good one if you have the audience for it and you want to make that your primary monetization. Where I'm saying it, it really doesn't make sense is I offer services. Other businesses offer services. If what you're selling is your audience, absolutely go for a sponsorship. But what if you're selling is something else, you should be using your podcast as a vehicle to do that instead. I know you've got good experience with sponsorship. You can never have too much experience with sponsorship <laughs> is my feeling. But could you give us uh, an example? Absolutely. Because I, I do want to be clear, this can work. So if you're, especially like it, it can be great for content creators and networks. You will note that it's in the book. It can be great for journalists, researchers, people who are creating information and making that available. If you've got news and media, charities, nonprofits, these can all be really great industries or, or kind of business areas to use sponsorship in. And I think charities and nonprofits actually have a, a really great use case for sponsorship because you've got a really kind of great audience facing reason to have sponsors. You don't want to use charity money to invest in production. You're having sponsors cover that cost. That's a win all around for everybody. And it can be a great way to help companies that want to either serve or have the good PR associated with being with this charity or nonprofit to get them in front of people who care about it. It can be really effective. I just think it needs to be done. Often when people come to me and they say, I, I want to get sponsors for my podcast to cover the cost of production. And I hate hearing that because you have a business. Use your podcast to sell more stuff to cover the cost of production. <laughs> it's going to be so much easier than getting sponsors to do it for most businesses. Megan, the final metric is downloads. Downloads. Why downloads as a metric? Are there other metrics along these lines? Should we expand it? Is it a definition that's broad enough to include multiple types of touch points? And then what blueprint does it fit? So downloads, what I'm talking about here, I'm kind of talking about them in the, I guess we'll call it the traditional podcasting way. A download is when your episode is downloaded onto a device and hopefully played by somebody. And of course, the, there could be variance in, in what platform calls it what thing. 
but it's the biggest, most popular metric that's out there. It's the one that everyone is paying the most attention to. It's the one that's making people feel bad if it's not big enough for their own shows. And I think it is for most businesses, the least important. <laughs> and I'll share why. It's because if you're a business and you're podcasting specifically for your business, again, this is very different than if you're podcasting as a business or if you're podcasting as a passion project, but for your business, if my podcast got 20,000 downloads tomorrow, but nothing else changed, who cares? I don't care. It doesn't mean any, like it doesn't, I don't have anything to show for it. I like, because my, if it's just a download, Unless it has a direct line to something else in the business, like engagement, like brand awareness, like sales, it's immaterial. So, I mean, downloads can be important. Downloads, you should keep an eye on them and you should watch them as an indicator of what's interesting and what's not, but they're not the be all and end all. So I do include them because they can be important. They should be watched. But for most businesses, they're not really the metric that's going to make the most difference. Well, Megan, on that note, we are at the end of our time for this episode. But before we leave, if our listeners want information on the book or to pre-order it, what would be the best place for them to go? They should go to podcastingforbusiness.com slash book. They're going to find all the information right there. Megan, I look forward to continuing this conversation. I look forward to it, too.